Hey yo, this is Yuki coming at you with another microdose. Today, I'm going to be debunking a very common myth around 2CB and giving you guys the lowdown on the difference between 2CB and 2C. Yes, those are different things. I know this is a very popular topic of conversation for people who follow the podcast, and I've definitely been seeing 2CB become a more prevalent topic in the drug user community. There's more curiosity, there's more interest, and it's almost this drug of legend that a lot of people want to try. But before you try it, you do have to know there are some differences and nuances uh, going on in the background here. I'm Yuki, joined by my co-host Reggie, and you're listening to Modern Day Hippie, the podcast about doing drugs in a responsible, fun, and safe way to improve your life. Before we jump into today's episode, a quick legal disclaimer. This podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Our goal is to educate and inform others about the realities of substance use in an engaging format. By listening to this podcast, you agree not to attempt to recreate anything found in this episode or any of our other content. We are not confessing to any acts stated in this podcast. The content in this episode should not be treated as factual or real in any way. Now with that, we hope you enjoyed today's show. We're going to start things off with 2CB. So this is the name for an actual chemical compound and a synthetic psychedelic. So the number two and the letters C and B. This literally stands for the compound 4-bromo-2,5-dimethoxyphenophthalamine. You know, crazy chemical name. Don't worry about that too much. Just know that 2CB does represent a specific chemical that was synthesized by this guy, Alexander Shulgin, in the 70s. He literally created MDMA and a couple hundred different psychedelics uh, during his time. And so 2CB is kind of this, you know, very coveted, very like kind of promised land psychedelic substance. It usually comes in the form of a white powder that a user snorts, not as the pink powder that I think a lot of people see and uh, and hear about nowadays. And it's known for having a very interesting psychedelic effect in that in a way that a lot of psychedelics kind of draw you inward and maybe make you a little bit less social. 2CB gives you these psychedelic sensations while also making you kind of more outgoing, more party-like. So a lot of people compare the effects of it to being on something like MDMA and LSD at the same time. Now, we're going to jump into the broader topic here, which is 2C. For the purpose of this podcast, I'm going to refer to this as kitchen sink 2C, uh, but know that people tend to use the terms 2C and 2CB interchangeably. So what is the origin of this term? It's literally a phonetic translation. So, you know, people went from saying 2CB to they just refer to it as 2C, even though that's not technically correct. And then people started just saying 2C, like T-U-S-I. You could also spell it as like 2CB, like T-U-S-I-B-I, things like that. And what Kitchen Sink 2C is at the end of the day is really just a brand name. It's like Coca-Cola. You go anywhere in the world, you see the Coca-Cola logo, you know exactly what to expect when you're buying a bottle, tasting it etc. So on the kitchen sink 2C side of of this analogy, it's legitimately dyed pink on purpose by the cartels mainly that are producing this drug as part of that brand. They want you, their users, to associate this bright pink fun color with the the drug and, and the effects that come with this. Now, there is a little bit of historical precedent as to why the pink coloring is used. We'll go into that in a future microdose. Uh, But for now, all you need to know is that naturally occurring, this drug is not pink. It is literally just pink food coloring. The issue with Kitchen Sink 2C is that it's never a single chemical. It's actually a cocktail of different drugs that are put together to try to vaguely recreate the effect of real 2CB. And so when Kitchen Sink 2C is being made, there's not even an agreed upon mix of what goes into that. You'll hear reports of like ketamine mixed with MDMA or with Coke mixed with like opioids, like a tramadol or something like that. Generally, what 
the cartels and the producers of Kitchen Sink 2C do is they mix at least one upper and one downer together. And then they may throw in something a little bit psychedelic, like a tiny bit of LSD into every batch. The uppers could be anything like Coke, uh, one of several methamphetamines, caffeine, and MDMA. And downers, you would see things like ketamine and different uh, types of opioids. I know that it's strange to think of a drug as just a mix of other drugs, but you have to remember that when these drugs are being created, even if it's just you know raw, pure cocaine, it literally comes down to some dude in a lab, probably in South America, literally cooking these chemicals in you know like a really ratchet kitchen setup um, that's also producing dangerous chemicals and they're wearing gas masks, things like that. There are plenty of vice videos that show the behind the scenes there, but I like to remind myself that a lot of these drugs are not made in professional labs. It is literally a cook putting these together. And this kitchen sink 2C is kind of the pinnacle and amalgamation of this actual cooking process of putting together these drugs. It comes down to the question of why is there not just more straight 2CB? Why is that not more common? Uh, The issue is that it's very just hard to find and it's harder to produce actual the 2CB chemical compound. But these cartels, they still want to profit off of the brand that's been created by 2CB and now Kitchen Sink 2C. The brand being this bright pink colored powder, the really fun like nights of partying and experiences that people have as, as a result of this drug. These cartels, keep in mind, they're the producers of probably most of the drugs that are consumed in the Americas, at least illicitly. And they can actually charge more for a gram of Kitchen Sink 2C than any of the individual drugs that they would put into it. You're looking at something, for example, like a gram of Coke, which it costs anywhere from 70 or 80 up to a little over $100, depending on where you are, versus something like 2CB, where it can easily cost $150 to $200 a gram just for being a mixture of these drugs being sold under what is technically not a different name, but a different pretense and very close to being a different name. Now, I can completely guarantee you that most of the 2CB that you think you've had, if you've ever done it, has just been kitchen sink 2C. This is, again, because pure 2CB is very hard to find. It's even more expensive. And the cartels want to mass produce this shit and make as much money uh, as, as they can off of it. So that begs the question, how do you tell the difference between you know when you buy some something that's called 2CB from your drug dealer, I would say there's probably like a four out of five chance that it's actually kitchen sink 2C. How are you supposed to know? Well, as always with your drugs, the first step before you even consume them is to test it. So in my experience, I've tested well over a dozen batches of quote unquote 2CB uh, in, in the last year or two. And literally about four out of five times, it's not actually 2CB. I found combinations of things containing ketamine, MDMA, and Coke mainly. Um, Not all at the same time necessarily, but those are the substances that show up in the reagents that I use on batches most of the time. Even after I test this, as long as I know for a fact that there isn't fentanyl in the mix, so I'll use fentanyl test strips, I'll usually still consume the drug. I mean, you know, in the US, when you are spending well over $150 a gram potentially for this kind of stuff, depending on where you get it, you don't necessarily want it to go to waste. But also, you know, when I'm taking it, I like being aware of what are the substances that are in it just so I can mentally prepare myself more and only doing bits at a time to not, you know, over over hit myself, not be overzealous with the effects that I'm getting from this drug. Now, something else that I've noticed purely anecdotally between Kitchen Sink 2C and 2CB is that real 2CB is known for having a very sharp sting when you snort it. I mean, the first couple of times that I snorted actual 2CB and I wasn't expecting it, it literally made me tear up. And even now, if I have real 2CB, like it does sting like hell. It will make you want to tear up. It like hurts a little bit inside of your nose. And that's something that I think just in my head I've picked up on as maybe being an indicator that something is closer to pure 2CB than kitchen sink 2C. Of course, there could be something that is part 
real 2CB and partially cut with other chemicals. That's the whole origin of how kitchen sink 2C started and ended up being just a mixture of drugs, none of them being 2CB. But I have noticed that when I know it's a mixture that is not pure 2CB and has all these other substances, it definitely still hurts a little bit in the way that snorting drugs tends to, but it doesn't have that same really sharp sting that literally makes my eyes almost water when I first snort it. The other way you can kind of tell is because pure 2CB by itself is extremely potent. We're talking like 20 milligrams is enough to really like send you over the moon and tripping super fucking hard. And so if you have a gram of what you think is 2CB and you're just seshing like half of it or more in a night, then I hate to break it to you, but it's definitely not 2CB. Uh, it's a mixture of other drugs and you could still be having a great time. That's not to say that, that you can't, but if you were to do half a gram of 2CB in a span of a couple of hours, you would be absolutely tripping dicks, dude. What I'll leave you with is a call to action to just go and educate your friends about the difference between 2CB and kitchen sink 2C. Reason being is because this drug is becoming increasingly popular in the US where I live and it's having a bit of a resurgence, I feel like, from when it first came around in like the 70s and 80s when think psychedelics were more kind of acceptable before war on drugs and shit like that. Like I mentioned, the name brand of 2CB has reached very far and wide. I mean, I have a ton of friends who've never tried it, but they've heard about it. They really want to try it. They want to find a dealer who has some. And it's just a matter of time before a lot of these people actually get to try it and may or may not know what they're getting themselves into. I think like average worst case is you do the drug, you probably still have an okay time on, let's say, a mixture of some molly, some ketamine, a bit of LSD. Like you're not going to have a bad time on that, but it is not necessarily the real drug. And anytime there's especially like a cocktail mixture of drugs, to me, that says that it's even more important to do that test for fentanyl and make sure that at least the drugs you're taking are things that will make sure that you have a good time. Thank you guys for listening. I hope this was helpful and get out there and, and tell your homies that not all 2CB is created equal. Truly, thank you for listening to the show. We seriously fucking appreciate it. If you want to help us out, just leaving a rating or a comment, you know, the drill would be incredibly helpful. But more importantly, share the knowledge and the love with your friends. Make sure they're getting the information they need on this topic that is so underserved and underappreciated in today's society. We'll see y'all next week.